Ear training is one of the things in my online lessons that right away I thought this is going to be my focus. So back in March of 2020, we went online and I had to scrap a lot of what I was doing. I had to say, oh, this project isn't going to really work, I'm going to delay that, or this student is struggling with reading and I'm going to need to come up with some new strategies before I can really address that in online learning. But I can do tons of ear training and I never get enough time to do it, so let's do it. And I'm not sure if everyone felt like that. So if you were one of the teachers who said, oh my gosh, ear training is going to be impossible. I usually do tons of it. And now, I, now I'm finding it so hard in online lessons, then this is going to be helpful for you. On the other hand, if you're someone who just doesn't get to use do ear training often enough at all, this is going to be helpful for you too. I'm going to share with you a whole bunch of different ear training games. So this is your warning right up front. I'm sharing with you all these ideas. Your job is to pick one. Our mantra here is J dot. Just do one thing. Just do one thing. I'm here to give you lots of ideas so that you can find one idea that works for you. Deal? You're not going to get overwhelmed by all of this? Okay, deal. I've decided it's a deal. <laughs> okay, my first, first game with that in mind is very simple. It is Do, Re, Me. <laughs> I should have put three question marks. This is where you simply play a pattern of Do, Re, Me and then one more note and you ask your student which one it was that you played last. And I like to do it that they give me an action as the answer. So I would normally do if I don't need the student to move too much, I would do do, re, and me. But if it's a student with the wiggles, it would be do on the floor. Me, maybe on the shoulder, sorry, re, maybe on the shoulders again, and then re up in the sky. I said that backwards as well. Me up in the sky. Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. We are going to do some of this. I want you to participate with me at home. It's the honor code. I can't make you do it. It's not Zoom. I can't see if you're doing it, but I want you to try, okay? So I'm going to play Do, Re, Mi, and then I'll play Do, Re, or Mi. If the last one I play is Do, I want you to touch the floor, or your knees will do. If the last one I play is Re, I want you to touch your shoulders, and if the last one I play is Mi, I want you to put your hands in the air. Okay, you ready? I am not going to switch to my keyboard view, so I have an overhead camera, obviously, for my keyboard for my online lessons. It's extremely useful almost all of the time, but when I do ear training games like this, I leave it right here. This is what it looks like in my lessons, and I'm going to do that to you too, so you really have to use your ears. If, however, you're playing this with a newbie student, showing them might be a good idea so that they can use both for a little while, and then once they're used to it, they can try to do it with just their ears, okay? Right. So, I'm walking over to my keyboard, and I'm gonna play Do, Re, Mi, you ready? Which one was it? Did you get it? It was Do, I hope you were touching the floor. Let's try one more. I'm going to assume you got that too. And again, if the student is doing really well, I would go higher or lower in general. And I'm changing key signatures all the time here. And then maybe lower. So whenever they're doing well, I'm going to go higher, lower, outside of the middle of the piano and faster. Whenever they're doing not so well, I would slow it down and stick around the middle range of the piano that tends to be the easiest to hear, especially in an online lesson environment, especially if they have poor quality computer speakers. Hope that makes sense. So that's Do Re Mi. It's, it's the simplest thing in the world. And obviously the next step is you can add another note. So I would add So next and then La and I would build up the pentatonic scale. And then if they're getting really good, I would fill in Fa 
and tea as well and make a full major scale or even then mix it up and play it as a minor, natural minor, etc, etc. You can go from there. But that basic exercise is wonderful. If you have multiple students together, you can also get one of them to play and the other one to answer. So take yourself out of the equation and then they swap. It's just such a simple thing to do, but it works great in online lessons and it gets them up and moving and it can be done in just a couple of minutes. Doesn't have to be a long session, just a few of those, wake up their ears, move on. No problem. Yes, Alain, that is definitely another option. Um, the reason for my simplified signs is partially to get them moving more and partially because I want, although the, the Kerwin hand signs are obviously logical, um, and if the student is learning them anyway, we would do them. But in this context, I like just a bigger motor skill. So that's why I'm going with that. Also, the option of being floor and then standing and then reaching up to the sky <laughs> as a great way to get them moving as well. Okay, and then my next idea. Are you ready? It's the simplest one. Echoes. Echo, echo, echo. But you probably don't do it enough, do you? Do you do enough echoing of patterns in your online lessons, in your lessons in general? Just saying to your student, okay, I'm gonna be on the three black keys and you be on the three black keys. I want you to play back what I play and then do the opposite. That's really important because the student gets the chance then to create. They also love testing you and seeing if they can trip you up, some of them, which is great fun. And I don't mind my ears being tested. Yes, yeah, sometimes I do fall on my face. If they go for ages and I can't remember their pattern, we both have a giggle about it and that is absolutely fine. Swapping back and forth doing echoes is a great exercise for them in creating the melody as well as playing it back to you. So I don't think I'll demo that one because I'm not going to assume that you're all at a piano right now. <laughs> Although I could get you to sing it back, but we'll skip that one. I think that's self-explanatory, but I wanted to bring it in here because I think we don't do it enough. <laughs> Carrie, that's hilarious. Because it's funny. Wouldn't you have done that to your teacher? It's great fun. And I'm happy to play along and... Um, have it be impossible and yeah, play the game with them. <laughs> it's good crack. Okay, the next one is a variation on echoes and that is Q&A. You might not think of this as strictly ear training, but here's how it works. It's like the echo except that you're gonna answer the question. I will demo this one again. Hopefully that'll be useful for you guys. So I'm gonna play a pattern that is not going to end on Do. Okay, and we'll stick to just Do, Re, Mi, because that's what I would have kids start with. So we're going to both be on the three black keys. I'm going to play a pattern, and I'm not going to end on Do. So here's what one sound like. Would sound like. I'd play something like that, right? And again, I wouldn't show them the overhead view, so I'm not doing that for you now. <laughs> and then I would tell them, okay, you play a pattern, the answer to my question, which has to end on Do. And if they've been doing this for a little while, they might do something like... Or they might play... And that's fine too, they'll get it in time. And then they play a question, something that doesn't end on Do, and I play the answer. Something that does end on Do. And we keep going back and forth like that. They shouldn't always be the answer because they need to hear how you imitate some of what they did, right? You build in some of the rhythm, you use the same meter, that kind of thing, so that they build up that sense of how it sounds like it matches the two little phrases. Melinda, I do that as well, yes, for sure, um, for the echoing. Q&A is obviously a little bit harder. When I'm doing though the singing and echoing back, I would tend to use the hand signs there. So I would sing do, re, mi, mi, and they need to sing it back. What I also like to do though, even in online lessons, is have them sing along with me. So I get them to mute themselves and I would just sing and use hand signs and they need to sing along with me and use the hand signs. Yes, they can pretend, but they'll still learn a lot. And if you have a student that's a little bit embarrassed of the situation, 
that might be a good option. They might end up accidentally singing along, and even if they don't do that in spite of themselves, they'll learn a lot by listening to you and doing the hand signs and feeling it and mouthing it because they'll have to pretend for you. So that's a good option for that as well, both of those. The next one is called Sing and Search. I put this in here to help those of you with students who are really struggling with pitch. Really, really struggling with pitch. So you, I'm sure many of you have had this student, you can let me know if you have, where they just can't seem to match pitch. They sing in a drone voice or they use a speaking voice accidentally instead of a singing voice. They can't really differentiate and they're doing this until they're through several years of lessons even, until they're say nine or ten years old or in their teens and they really can't match the pitch. So this is a simple exercise to help with that, with the caveat that if your student is younger than say nine or ten or they only just started lessons, please don't fuss too much over them not matching pitch, don't feel like you need to do rudimentary exercises or um, intervention sort of exercises because uh, they will get it with time, with these types of exercises, right? So even if they are singing along and it's not right, um, then it won't just give them time. But for students that are really struggling or just as an additional exercise to help them along, sing and search is a great way to work on pitch. So again, I wouldn't be showing them the keyboard, so I'm not gonna show you. What I would do is just play a note, so I play, Sorry, it's awkward at this angle. So play it a few times, and you guys are gonna play along. Sing back that note. Sorry, I won't be that silly. I'm not a children's entertainer. Um, so you sing back that note, and then they need to hold on to that and try and find it on the piano. Yes, if they've no singing voice at all, this won't always work. You could do it with you playing and them searching for it, instead but if they have a bit of it but it's just a bit looser than you would like on their sense of pitch this is a great exercise to do so you need to keep singing that note hopefully you guys are still singing it and maybe if you do have a piano nearby or you have absolute pitch um, you can tell me what it was anyone put their guess into the comments so that's a simple one for pitch recognition the next one is called Meter moves. This is where I prescribe different activities for different meters. So a great put together version of this is called time to jive, but you can do this on your own, uh, you know, loosely based on just these instructions, okay? <laughs> Tara was the first to get it. It was indeed an A. Well done, Tara. Okay, so this is where you give them different dance moves. Okay, so for those of you who don't know this already, I did a fair amount of dancing growing up, especially Irish dancing. And so identifying meter when I had to do that test in exams and stuff was never really a problem because I just imagined myself dancing a particular dance. And when I realized that was um, how I was doing it and that most kids didn't have that reference point and really struggled with this in that exam scenario or just in general they weren't good at feeling that those different meters then I started to teach them okay I'll just teach them basic dances so if you're up for it get up and dance with me here's what we need to do if it's two four you're gonna step side to side to side to side just step if it's three, you're gonna do one, two, three, one, two, three, basic walls, right? One, two, three. And if it's four, four, I have them do a box. So one, two, right? You get the idea. You don't even have to make it that complicated. I've also done it in a different way in the time to jive game. There's all sorts of ways to do it. The important part is just to assign an action. And again, it could be uh, something you can see more clearly if you want to leave them sitting down. So one, two, one, two, one, two, three, like that. And then put on different examples of music and have them do the marching dance to see if it fits. The matching dance to see if it fits. 
And that's how they can figure out which time signature it is. If you restrict it, right, make it easier to guess and then you can gradually increase it from there. We have two left, I think. Yes, two left. The next one is Tonic Stance. What a weird title. Tonic Stance, that just came into my head. I was thinking tonic, anyway, is tonic versus dominant. And what you do again, actions, I love actions for these because when you're just using your ears, when you don't have to play, it's just such a great opportunity to get up off the seat. And if you have noticed yourself getting more stiff, maybe your back hurting, maybe you're more fatigued, maybe various other symptoms from doing online lessons yourself. I know many teachers have, and it's normally because we're just not moving. In fact, when I was teaching in the studio in autumn, uh, that that was worse actually because I couldn't stand. So I stand there for online lessons, but in the studio I had to stay glued to my chair and I really noticed a difference. And if we feel like that, then a little five-year-old, a little 13-year-old is going to feel that worse and they're often going to be reluctant to say anything to you. I mean, I do tell them, get up and stretch whenever you want, like just tell me, oh I need to stretch for a second, that's fine, but giving them more and more chances to get up and down that are built into the lesson is great. With that in mind, tonic stance is about tonic versus dominant. Tonic versus dominant. And you're going to just pick two actions. So I like them to be something related to resting and like ready to pounce. <laughs> That's what we'll call the dominant. So let's have like a tiger stance. I'll change this every time, honestly, based on the student and their interest. But let's say it's a tiger stance. They hear the dominant chord and then they need to sit back on the piano bench if it's a tonic. And the rest of the time they're going to march around. And for this, I'll play something, just a simple vamp. So, um pa, um pa, um pa, right? And then I land on one or the other. So, again, if you're up for it, I'm actually not going to show the keyboard on this either, because I usually wouldn't for this kind of thing. I sometimes would, but not always. And I don't want to mess with all this lovely writing and everything. So, I'll leave it on this view, and you won't see me for a second. I want you to move around the room and you'll either do your tiger pose or you'll sit back down, okay? Here is how it might sound, something very simple. I want it to be easy for them to march along to too, right? So I would just do a... Right, again and again and again, or I might do a... I hope so. And then start again. Right, so it's about feeling that difference. Now you can do this with absolutely anything this versus that. I think you can see through the sample. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. And again, it can be one minute. If you hear the tiger sound, if you hear the sitting sound, you don't even have to call them tonic and dominant, although it's a good time to just sort of not make your students say those words, but just build in that vocabulary, right? Start to build it in naturally to what you're saying so that they pick it up little by little, or at least sounds familiar when they need to learn it later. Last one, throat repertoire. What am I talking about? Well, this has actually been a big part of what we've been doing with ear training here in the studio. And that is Rot Repertoire by Samantha Coates is what I'm referring to here. So if you're not familiar with Samantha, she runs Blitz Books. Those are her books, uh, theory resources, and she has a blog as well. And she creates Rot Repertoire, which are Rot pieces, but they come in three levels. So there's a level one, level two, level three. And they're really great for that. And the, the idea behind them is that you can teach the student level one by rote and then you can put up level one and two and say spot the difference, what's the difference between these and they start to make those connections between what they're listening to and the differences and the notation. So it's like taking a broad brush 
idea of the notation rather than here's all the details and now you decode it. It's backwards in a way and it helps students with their reading as well as playing these great pieces by rote. But I've been twisting this and there's a, a YouTube video, a short YouTube video here on the channel about how I've been doing this so you can check that out. Just look for Rote Repertoire Nicola Canton or something like that or Rote Repertoire Colourful Keys and it should pop up. But to tell you briefly the way we were doing it is I teach them the first level by rote and then I play them the audio for the next level. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to breach any copyright. But to the students, I play them the audio for the next level. And I ask them to spot the difference with their ears now. Instead of showing them the sheet music. And it's just as valuable that way around. It's really wonderful. And it's been a great thing for my students to wake up their ears and to start to notice the changes in the pattern. And, yeah, to start to have fun with it. I wanted to come back to that question, Charlotte, because um, I know I was a bit confusing there. Time to Jive is a game that is coming out on the 1st of April. So it's one I've been testing. It will come out soon in the library, but it's not out yet. It's on the 1st of April is when that's hitting the library. Yeah, so that's Samantha Coates' uh, rote repertoire, and that's how we've been using it. So you've got seven ideas there. Which one are you going to do? Pick one and do it this week. Commit to it right here. It'll make you that much more likely to follow through. Mm -hmm.